G'day guys, in this video I'm going to very briefly summarize for you the main formulas you can expect to find in a first year statics course. So let's get started on static equilibrium. Since statics deals with objects that don't accelerate and don't rotate, that means that the sum of forces acting on a body will be equal to zero, and the sum of moments on a body will also be equal to zero. So to show this in a little bit more detail, if we have some body like this, then the sum of all external forces acting on this body must perfectly cancel out to zero. It also means that the sum of moments of all of these forces about any point, I've called it A, must also equal to zero. And in case you need a quick crash course on what a moment is, it's a force times by a perpendicular distance. So in this case, the moment caused by this force about point A is the magnitude of this force times by the perpendicular distance from that force vector to point A. All right, now let's talk about reactions. Pin supports do exactly what you suspect they do. They prevent a movement at that point, but they don't prevent rotation. So this thing is free to rotate if it can. And that means that in general, you'll have two forces acting on this, on this object at this point. You'll have a horizontal and a vertical force. A roller support, however, is very similar to a pin with one subtle difference. It's also free to move along this point as well. So that means our reaction force will only have one component. It will have a force which is um, perpendicular to the ground like this. And lastly, a cantilevered support is where you've got a beam embedded in the wall in one end. And as you can imagine, the beam is stuck in the wall, so it's not able to move and it's not able to rotate at this point either, which means that we'll have a whole bunch of different forces, a shear force, a possible axial force, and a bending moment, all preventing movement vertically, moving horizontally, and rotation about this point as well. Now that we've talked about reaction forces in some detail, let's talk about trusses. In a simple truss like this, we can find the internal forces in each one of these members by using method of joints, or method of sections, or a combination of the two. It turns out if we were to create a cut selection around this particular pin joint, then the free body diagram will look like this with our internal forces now popping out and showing up in our free body diagram. Notice that the only equation you can use here to help find these internal forces is the sum of forces is equal to zero. The moment equation won't help in this case. It won't give us any new information. However, method of sections is arguably a much more powerful method because it allows us to take a whole section cut and gives us a few additional equations. So if we were to take a free body diagram of this particular cut just here, for starters, we'll notice that the reaction force at this roller support will, will show up on our diagram, and our internal forces will be showing up too. And to help us find all of these unknowns, we can use the sum of forces is equal to zero in both x and y directions, and we can use the sum of moments about any point is also equal to zero. Now let's quickly talk about centroids. A centroid is your geometric center of a shape. So in this particular cloud-looking shape that I've got here, your centroid is located right in the middle, at a distance x-bar and y-bar from some defined axis. And we can find x-bar and y-bar by using these formulas just here. Notice that A is the area of your entire shape, and DA is the infinitesimal chunk of area that makes up your object. And there are many such values of DA you can choose to make the integration easier. X and Y are the distances from your axis towards the center of your chunk of area DA. Now let's consider these formulas just here, which are for a set of discrete shapes. So let's consider one giant assembly, which consists of three shapes just here. And let's say we wanted to find the centroid of this entire shape. Well, intuitively, you can tell that the centroid will be located roughly around here but we can find out exactly where it is by using these formulas. We know that the sum of x, i, a, i are our distances from our axis towards the centroids of each of our shapes respectively. And a, i are the areas of each of these shapes respectively as well. And a is the total area of all of the shapes. So in this particular case, x1 will be this distance. It's gonna be the distance from our axis towards the centroid of our first shape and A1 is going to be the area of this particular triangle just here. And X2 is going to be the distance from our axis towards the centroid of our second shape, and A2 is going to be the area of this rectangle just here. 
Likewise, you can go through the same process to find y bar as well. Now that we've covered centroids in a little bit of detail, let's quickly cover the second moment of area, which is also sometimes confusingly referred to as the moment of inertia. I subscript x is your second moment of area about our x-axis. So if we have a simple shape, say it's a rectangle, and we wanted to find out the second moment of area about this shape about the x-axis, if our axis is placed here, then we know that's going to be equal to the integral of y squared dA, where dA is just a small element of area that makes up your shape, dx dy, and y is the vertical distance from our axis towards that element of area. Now rather than solve for the second moment of area directly using this formula, we can apply this formula just here, which makes use of the radius of gyration. So if we have k subscript x, our radius of gyration, we can find our second moment of area quite easily by applying k subscript x squared times by a, where a is the total area of your shape. Typically, k will be given to you in some form of table. Alternatively, you can find the second moment of area about the x-axis by applying the parallel axis theorem which states that i subscript x is equal to i x bar, which is your second moment of area about the x-axis with an axis placed at the centroid, which I've drawn in pink right here, plus a dx squared, where a once again is the total area of your shape and dx is the distance between your two parallel axes. In this case, dx would be this distance just here. You can say the exact same thing for i subscript y, the second moment of area about your y-axis. Now before I move on, I want to very briefly mention that ix and iy are properties of our shape that depend on where we put our axis. And typically the larger ix and iy, the better for engineers, because it shows that that particular shape has a good resistance to bending. But that's something you'll find out in further Mechanics of Materials courses. Next, let's talk about distributed load. Not all forces are point forces. In fact, we can have a force per unit length denoted by this Greek letter omega. So if we have a beam which is subjected to a distributed load, then this, then this distributed load can be replaced with an equivalent point force P at a distance D, where P is given by the integral of omega dx, and d is given by the integral of x omega dx divided by your force p. Now these formulas will work just fine, but an alternative way to think about this is p can be viewed as the area under this curve, and d can be thought of as the x coordinate of your centroid of this shape just here as well. Now that we've talked about distributed loads, let's quickly talk about shear forces and bending moments. Let's consider a beam like this, which is simply supported. We can make a cut selection around this part of the beam at, say, some distance x, and we'll notice the free body diagram in this particular case will look like this. We'll have our reaction forces here, we'll have our external force just here, and we'll also have our internal shear force V, which must be there in order to maintain static equilibrium, and an internal bending moment, which must also exist at this point to maintain static equilibrium as well. Notice that convention is to assume that V is always facing downwards and M is always facing upwards. Now, you can find the internal shear force and bending moments directly by making several cut selections along your beam and analyzing it using the sum of forces is equal to zero and the sum of moments is equal to zero. Or alternatively, you can use these formulas just here, where dv dx is equal to minus omega, where once again, omega is your distributed load acting on your beam, and dm dx is equal to v. For simple objects like this, I think it's easier to find v and m directly using first principles, but for complicated beams with a whole bunch of distributed loads acting on it, I think it's often easier to use these formulas. Anyway, guys, those are those basic formulas summarized for you. I hope that made sense. Cheers.